Good afternoon. I'm Craig Soche, Assistant Professor of European History at Southeastern Louisiana University, where currently we are under attack. However, good news, we are fighting back trench by trench. Anyway, I am the chair for what promises to be an engaging panel in British history here at the LHA, and a panel that includes not only two of my comrades and close friends from Southeastern, but also, quite frankly, some of my very favorite topics, consumption, appetites, Napoleonic Wars, and of course, naughty nuns. In any event, each panelist will have 20 minutes, and then we will open it up for some questions or comments. And for any participants who might want to ask a question or pose a question or uh, make a comment, uh, we ask that you put your questions and comments uh, in the chat box. And so our first presenter is Dr. Samantha Cabell. Sam received her PhD in 2010, University of Exeter, the, Marit the Maritime Historical Studies. She is Assistant Professor of Military History at Southeastern Louisiana University, and she holds the Distinguished Teaching Endowed Professorship in the Humanities. Her research focuses on British naval and maritime subjects, uh, focusing primarily on uh, the Napoleonic Wars and the War of 1812. Her publications include Midshipmen and Quarterdeck Boys in the British Navy, as well as chapter contributions to the Battle of New Orleans Reconsidered, Americans in Nelson's Navy, and the US Naval Academy's New Interpretations in Naval History. She's also published several journal articles. Sam also serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Naval History. I will also add she is a proud veteran of Maribel Dietz's seminar in medieval European history. Today, she's going to speak to us about the impact of Napoleon's uh, first abdication on the British military campaign for New Orleans during the latter stages of the War of 1812. So it is great pleasure for me to introduce a close friend, Dr. Sam Cavell. Thank you, Craig. Much appreciated. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Gosh, I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to be sharing. I guess it's this one. There's too many options here. It, does that look okay? Can you guys see that? Okay, awesome. All right, well, the purpose of my talk here today is to connect two apparently unrelated events into nominally separate wars. And those, of course, are the abdication, the first abdication of Napoleon Bonaparte uh, and his subsequent exile to Elba, which happens in April of 1814, and the Battle of New Orleans, which happens in uh, January of 1815. And of course, these are in the Napoleonic and the War of 1812, different conflicts. But I would argue that the connectivity between these events actually suggests that the War of 1812 is really just another theater in a much larger global conflict that is, that is going on and is centered around Great Britain as this naval and commercial hegemon. So where I wanna begin this is in April of 1814 with three almost simultaneous events that take place. The first happens on April 1st, and that is the arrival of a new commander in chief for the North America station. This is Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane, and he will take over command of the British war in North America. And his job here is to be a bulldog. He is to bring hard war to North America and bring a rapid end to the conflict in Britain's favor. Those are his orders. And he's certainly the right man to do the job. The second event happens on April 6th, and that is the surrender of Napoleon after the Battle of Paris. A few days later, he will uh, sign the Treaty of Fontainebleau and accept exile to Elba. And that of course is the problem. Uh, as you can see from the map, it's ra rather close to the coast of both France and previously occupied Italy. And this will be the driving factor behind all decision making from the British cabinet from this point on, uh, the, the insecurity of this place as a prison for Napoleon. Now, the third event, which happens on April 14, is the uh, final repeal by James Madison as president of the embargo, the trade embargo which has shut down American trade in various forms since 1806. And 
the whole idea here behind these trade embargoes was to punish Britain and France for their predations on neutral American shipping. Both of them had been preying on neutral shipping. And of course, America had tried to be neutral in the Napoleonic Wars, didn't work too well. And the only injured parties in this entire uh, shutdown of trade are going to be the North American, uh, the New England shippers, the blue water traders who are generally federalist and very opposed to the war anyway, and also the American government, who has lost out on nearly a decade's worth of trade revenue. And the fact is that by April of 1814, the American government is virtually bankrupt. And what Madison understands is that now, at least theoretically, the British are going to be able to focus all of their naval and military might against the United States. And he's going to need rapid catch in order to meet that challenge. And this is one way of, of mitigating that problem. So in terms of Britain's goals in North America, what changes after April of 1814? Well, the first and the primary goal is unchanged. It is the same as it has always been in the War of 1812, and that is for Britain to protect Canada. All of their East Coast diversions have been about this goal. It has to protect Canada for its trade reasons, as well as for the fact that it is now the vital shipbuilding timber resource that keeps the Royal Navy in business. So that's sort of the primary defensive goal. But what suddenly happens in April, now that Napoleon is gone, is that the British government, which is being led by Lord, Lord Liverpool as prime minister, now starts to consider other options. And the fact that now maybe we don't want to bring such a rapid end to the war, but maybe we can also look at punishing the US government for the fact that she has really kicked Britain while she's down. While Britain's in an existential fight against Napoleonic France, that's when the Americans choose to attack. And of course, that's why they choose to attack uh, while she is distracted. But there, this punitive aim certainly becomes a big piece of the story. And then the other factor is Britain must maintain its position within the European uh, negotiations that have already started to take place in the wake of Napoleon. It has to maintain its power relative to its European allies. And certainly it's been in a top position here. It was Britain who funded the Sixth Coalition against New Orleans, uh, sorry, against Napoleon. And just to ram home the point is the idea that overall she has to protect Canada. So the two men who are going to do that are Cochrane, and we'll come back to him. But the man who is in charge of the ground forces is Major General Sir George Prevost. Now, reinforcements will be sent to Prevost. He'll get about 27,000 additional troops. But contrary to popular belief, most of them do not come from the Duke of Wellington's army. Wellington will not give up his army. Uh, they come from various other sources. And what Prevost is supposed to do with these uh, men is to defend the Canadian border and maybe even make incursions into American territory, uh, gain territory that can then be traded for a more secure border uh, with the United States. Okay, so he's got his task there. Cochrane, when he arrives on station on April 1st, what he finds is he's in charge of about 45 ships of various sizes, which up till now have been keeping a pretty tight blockade of the East Coast from the Chesapeake up to about Maine. But he knows that his orders are to deepen the, the quality of this war. He has to extend the blockade uh, and to do so, he's going to need more vessels. So he's constantly petitioning throughout April back to the Admiralty to get more vessels to come over and help him in this task. And he knows, too, that with the lifting of the embargo, there'll be all sorts of traders who are trying to get to sea and he'll need more vessels up in the northeast just to even handle them. Ultimately, he will be uh, on the receiving end of about another 32 or so vessels all up around 70, 75 vessels on station at any given time. So he is able to extend this blockade down into uh, the South Coast and into the Gulf of Mexico in a meaningful way. Now, now, what this does is it changes everything in the South because up till now, New Orleans has not really been a viable target for Britain. It's always been on the radar, but she's never been a doable target because there's been no means of, of controlling the sea lanes and the access to the region. Now that's possible. And so all of a sudden, Liverpool's cabinet is starting to seriously think about what it can do with New Orleans uh, in this war. Now, New Orleans is very interesting on the Canadian protection side of its war goals, because uh, if you're going to create diversions, well, 
New Orleans is the ultimate diversion here. If you're going to draw people away from the Canadian border, American troops away from the Canadian border, bring them as far south as you possibly can. And that's all for the better in the protection of this northern region. But it also opens up opportunities for these punitive goals. And first among them is Britain's opportunity now to seriously question the legality of the Louisiana Purchase. Now, keep in mind that this is a transaction that no one except Napoleon Bonaparte and the American government considered legal. Right? The rest of Europe considers the Louisiana Purchase an illicit trade. It was not Napoleon's to sell. It actually belongs to Spain. So if Britain can offer the inhabitants of Louisiana, especially New Orleans, which of course it will capture, uh, and it knows that that population is quite disaffected and, and doesn't really like the American government anyway, if they offer the population of New Orleans the opportunity to return to the governance of Spain, then this does several things. First of all, it's not really very altruistic towards Spain, but it will allow Britain to leverage its position at the negotiating table in Europe. It puts it in a very powerful position to say, here, we are handing back territory to one of our allies and also allows it to kind of get some deals out of Spain that it's also looking to achieve. But the other thing that it does is at the very least, this can put the brakes on the expansion of American progress into the West, uh, put the brakes on American agricultural development and therefore American commerce. And the mercantilist interests back in Britain are very interested in all of this because it's actually going to help their interests in the West Indies. They're very worried about all this American trade coming into the West Indies and this might help uh, put at least a slowdown in that department as well. And all of it, of course, is designed to punish the US government and humiliate them in the process. And so the campaign for New Orleans begins as a massed military operation of overwhelming force. The government basically tells Lord Wellington, sorry, we're taking 7,000 of your crack troops and your right-hand man, uh, Lord Roland Hill, the senior general, and they're going to be given independent command to go and attack New Orleans. So it really is going to be this, this shock and awe force that goes up against what is a very lightly defended part of the American coast. However, what seems to happen almost immediately, all this goes down at the end of July in 1814, and, and letters are going to be sent out to Cochrane telling him to expect these 7,000 men under Roland Hill, but that will rapidly change. Because what's happening on Elba is that all sorts of troubles are kicking off. Napoleon's getting very restless, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's had some really important visitors from Britain, uh, members of the Whig opposition party, who have been visiting him and bringing him secrets, telling him essentially that, that Liverpool's government is interested in sending him farther afield, all the way down to St Helena. So what Napoleon understands is that if he's going to make his break and move, He's going to have to do it before he's quite literally sent to the ends of the earth. And the British papers are reporting that Napoleon's already escaped, all sorts of rumours start flying. But the key issue here is that the government itself is becoming deeply concerned about what is actually happening with him and that he is planning an immediate return. And the result is, is that almost immediately the plans for New Orleans are cut back significantly. Um, new letters will be sent out to Cochrane telling him, sorry, you're not getting Roland Hill and 7,000 crack troops. You're now going to get Major General Sir John Lambert, uh, who is nowhere near the level of operator as Hill is, and about 2,200 troops. And what you have to do is combine them with the forces you already have in the Chesapeake under Robert Ross. And we estimate that together you'll probably be able to cobble up uh, between five and 6,000 soldiers, sailors and Marines for the operation against New Orleans. And that's not what Cochrane's trying to do here. He, he actually wanted to use Robert Ross's forces as diversionary forces on the Georgia coast and in uh, Florida and in other places. And now that's not going to be able to happen. Well, September for Britain in North America brings nothing but disaster. Uh, Prevost does move his army against uh, the American armies at Plattsburgh near Lake Champlain, and he is decisively defeated. Uh, it's a pretty, you know, drub, big, good drubbing for uh, the British here. And ultimately, he will pay the price for this. He'll be essentially cashiered for it. But it means that there will be no seizure of territory, American territory, from this army's progress. And then at Baltimore, we know too that the army has some really bad luck. Robert Ross is killed in the preliminaries before the attack on Baltimore. 
And we know that uh, Cochrane's bombardment of Fort McHenry is also unsuccessful and he's, has to, he's gonna have to pull back. But at least Cochrane can still focus on planning for New Orleans, which he thinks is going ahead at all speed. Now, there are other people who are putting a lot of weight on New Orleans as well. And these are the folks who are negotiating for the British cause at the, uh, the Ghent uh, talks, the Ghent peace talks with the Americans. Now, this man here, Henry Goldburn, who was circled, uh, is very much looking for some sort of leverage to be able to get this neutral buffer zone or some sort of better border with Canada to protect it. And he's always sort of thought that uh, maybe we could give this area to our Native American allies and that might create this, this neutral zone. Or if we can't get Plattsburgh and the region around upstate New York, well, New, New Orleans is the best possible negotiating point from here on. Once the British capture New Orleans, we can certainly use that as, as a trading tool. So he's still quite sanguine even after news about the failure of Plattsburgh happens. Now, the other thing that's happening in Europe is the official start of the Congress of Vienna, which kicks off at the beginning of October. And what immediately becomes apparent to the British negotiators here is that the other serious players of Prussia, Russia, and Austria are seeing the continuing American war as a really embarrassing factor for Britain. And they're using it, uh, they're holding it over Britain's head, essentially saying, look, this is a former colony that has no army and no Navy to speak of, and you can't subdue them. What is going on? And Lord Castlereagh, who was the chief British negotiator, starts sending back uh, letters to, to London saying, look, you've got to bring this thing to a rapid close. We have got to shut this down because it's affecting the serious stuff that is going on here on the continent and we cannot lose out. We cannot afford to risk this. So a lot of pressure is going to be put on the government to, to end the war quickly. Now, Cochrane, of course, is still moving full speed ahead with the plans for New Orleans. He's got his rendezvous for all of the troops and the material that is supposed to be coming over from Europe to reinforce him to get ready for the New Orleans campaign. But by mid-November, what he realizes is that he is seriously short of a lot of things uh, for this campaign. Number one, he's short of men. He's, he understands by now, of course, that he's not getting 7,000 men. He's only getting his 2,200 and he's gonna have to figure it out and, and make it work as best he can. He's in a pretty dire position there. The other issue, he had requested from the Admiralty a lot of field artillery, artillery on wheels that can go easily over land. And he has sent none of it, absolutely zero. And what he's gonna to have to make use of instead are naval guns. And they come on these truck carriages with these tiny little wheels here. As you can see, they're not ideal for moving over land, especially over soggy land as he's gonna find uh, on his pathway to New Orleans. The other thing he requested was flat bottom boats to transfer his men across the shallow lakes and waterways to get to New Orleans. Well, the Admiralty doesn't send any of these either. Uh, he doesn't have enough provisions and he also doesn't have the senior army officer in charge of the campaign, Major General Sir Edward Pakenham. And Pakenham will not arrive until a later convoy and get to New Orleans on the 25th of December. Now, Part of the reason that a lot of his requests were ignored has to do with the, the massing of forces to get ready for a Napoleonic return. That's, there's, there's much more interest on that than there is on New Orleans now. But the rest of it has to do with lots of problems brewing back at home, domestic unrest. And uh, Liverpool's government is really facing some serious challenges from the Whig opposition who are threatening to overturn their power. In fact, Liverpool suspends parliament at the end of 1814 because he's so worried about a vote of no confidence and that his government will topple. There is also a very distinct change in public opinion about the war in North America. This is a war-weary Britain. They've had enough. It's been almost 22 years of continuous warfare. And between the taxes and the, the sacrifices, they're done. And, and they just want this war over and, and the North American war becomes enormously popular. And this is a really big factor in, in changing the government's approach to what is happening here. And together, all of these pressures are going to be landed upon Henry Goldburn to bring a rapid end to the war. And what he negotiates at the Treaty of Ghent are, are pretty light terms for America, really, status quo antebellum terms. Now, Liverpool was well aware of the fact that if he had pushed this war a little bit longer, what he probably could have achieved was a better outcome for Britain. But the population was simply not gonna to tolerate it. It had to end. 
So the Treaty of Ghent is signed on the 24th of December of 1814. And as most of you already know, that is not the end of the war. OK, legally, it is not the end of the war. The war has to keep going until that treaty is ratified. It is a meaningless document otherwise. So when the Battle of New Orleans finally does kick off on January 8, it takes place fully within the realms of an ongoing legal war. And of course, it is a terrible disaster for the British and Pakenham is killed in the opening volleys that take place. And as the senior officer left standing, Cochrane shoulders 100 percent of the blame. For this. Now, it is quite clear that although Cochrane did make some mistakes in the uh, strategic planning of this operation, there are a lot of other factors that contributed to its failure too. Number one amongst them is the fact that the cabinet keeps altering their plans. In the plans for New Orleans start out as this massive military operation. They are almost immediately cut back to a raid and then they are reconstituted as some like half-baked invasion force minus all the things it needs to succeed, like boats and men and artillery and all these other things. Uh, political opposition at home is also key, as is the absolute absence of any further support for continuing this war in North America and all of these problems that are, are being piled on the government from the Congress of Vienna as well. The fact that there were these confused war aims, I think, is also really responsible for what has happened. And so just as this all began with a confluence of three events in April of 1814, they kind of end in three almost simultaneous events in February of 1815. And the first is that Cochrane is recalled. He's recalled to Britain in disgrace. And in fact, he will never receive another command at sea after this point. It, it effectively ends his career. On February 17, that is the date that Madison finally ratifies the treaty. And that is the end of the War of 1812. Now, what he does with this end of the war is actually really interesting. Madison sort of becomes the master of spin. Uh, he takes the victory at New Orleans, uh, the sort of equivocal victory at Fort McHenry, and the uh, early victories of the frigates in North America, which really ended up the first, first six months of the war in 1812, and wraps it into a victory narrative for America in the war itself, um, despite the fact that they lost tons of battles on land and at sea. And it becomes this foundational national narrative, which ultimately is very important for uh, United States national identity. And then the final event, which happens on February 26, is the return of Napoleon. He escapes from Elba, comes back to the coast of France for his 100 days on the march to Waterloo. And so I'll leave it there, but I, I just ultimately wanted to express the idea that we can't just look at these isolated events like the Battle of New Orleans. We have to look at them in their global context if we really are going to understand how and why things happened the way they did. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Cabell. Our second presenter is Dr. Lauren Doty. Lauren received her PhD in 2017 from Louisiana State University where she specialized in Anglo-Scandinavian history between the 9th and the 11th centuries. Dissertation is entitled Viking Nobility in Anglo-Saxon England, the Expansion of Royal Authority through the Use of Scandinavian Accommodation and Integration, and is the springboard for today's discussion. After completing her graduate work, Lauren began teaching at Southeastern Louisiana University in 2018 and has been an active faculty member. Though a busy mom to two young and energetic children, Lauren has shared her research at a number of conferences, including the International Congress of Medieval Scholars, which is the largest gathering of medieval scholars in North America, as well as a number of smaller speaking engagements. Lauren hopes to publish the larger version of her paper at some point in the near future. This afternoon, she's gonna to speak to us about the challenge and the impact of determined monastics and churchmen on royal authority in order to further the monastic campaign for reform. And it is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Dr. Lauren Doty. Thank you so much, Craig. And I will start this by apologizing to Dr. Sam Cavell. She has heard uh, this particular paper in its roughened form about a year and a half ago, a year ago, uh, in a WIPS. Uh, so I apologize to Sam for having to sit through yet another 10th century 
royal scandal, but all in good fun. All right. So the 10th century West Saxon court was a hotbed of aristocratic factionalism, clerical intrigue, and sexual real politic. Successful kings since Alfred had relied heavily on maintaining a delicate balance of patronage amongst noble houses while simultaneously encouraging religious endowment and clerical support. The making, or far more interesting, the unmaking of a king depended on his ability to enforce his royal authority while treading a fine path between noble ideals of kingship and the actuality of his rule. 10th century West Saxon kings found themselves facing serious challenges to their royal authority, not merely from Scandinavian incursions, but more ambitiously from determined monastics who sought political and religious reforms. A king's reputation for sexual amorality could be used by aspiring churchmen to manipulate the narrative of past and future kings to their own ends. In particular, the reigns of Idwig, who I'll focus on today, and later Edgar de Peaceable, demonstrate how a single determined churchman could wholly manipulate the narrative of royal authority in order to further a monastic campaign of reform. Monastic memory obfuscates the, the reigns of these significant 10th century monarchs, allowing for a proliferation of propaganda to blur the historical reality of the later 10th century. Rather than simple religious devotion, the motivations of the leading churchmen of the 10th century, uh, particularly bishops Athelwald and Dunstan, seem to revolve around the promotion of Benedictine monastic reform and the discouragement of the long-held tradition of joint kingship. Taking advantage of court factionalism, which tended to revolve around the manipulation of propaganda uh, surrounding the throne worthiness of eighthlings or throne worthy princes, and thus the legitimacy of the king's wives, these devout religious leaders sought to reframe the narrative of royal authority. The ability of such men as Archbishop Dunstan to praise or condemn a king and thereby sway court politics through nothing more than the manipulation of sexual narratives must be placed within the wider context of monastic reformers' attempts to develop Christian ideals of kingship. Uh, we begin with and focus on the reign of King Edwig today. The son of King Edmund of Wessex and his first wife, Elfgaifa, Edwig took the throne of the West Saxons after the death of his uncle on 23 November 955, his uncle being Idrid. Crowned at Kingston upon Thames in January of 956, Edwig is described by his own kinsman, Aethelweird, uh, as for his great beauty, got the nickname All Fair from the common people and deserved to be loved. A young boy of merely 15, Edwig's assumption of the throne from his uncle, Edred, was not the only major political upheaval facing Wessex in the mid 10th century. Uh, Wollstone, the Archbishop of York, had died to be succeeded by a man named Ossetel, a late appointment of his uncles. Athelstan, the half king of East Lang Anglia, had died as well, as well as a rise of four newly minted eldermen uh, within Edwig's own court. The rapid rise of such men as Elfhir of Mercia and his brother Elfhir uh, to positions of prominence within the inner circle of the young king's court has led some scholars to suggest instability. Rather, historian Sashi Jakmir acknowledges the influx of new men as reflecting a more likely source, that of rewarding long distance kinsmen, kinsmen of the East Anglian and Mercian royal houses. This meteoric rise of new men could be seen as giving credence to Dunstan opining that the young King Edwig was, quote, a youth indeed in age and endowed with little wisdom in government. However, Edwig's investiture in the positioning of new faces within the court's inner circle could rather and should rather be seen as an attempt by the young king to harness court factualism to his advantage. Then a the dynastic history of the West Saxon court was a complex and inbred amalgamation of powerful families, each with possible claims to the throne of the newly united, though hardly unified, Saxon kingdom. By investing in these new men, Edwig solidified his own coalition of loyalists in a divided court. For example, one of Edwig's appointments included the later hero of the Battle of Malden, 
Birthnoth of Mercia. Charter evidence dating from 956 shows Edwig granting lands to a church in Worcester, with Birthnoth attesting as first thane, and then later in other charters as elderman. Naming evidence suggests that rather than an upstart, Birthnoth was actually related to the Mercian royal house, as Birth is a common indication of royal ancestry, the first uh, bits of the nomenclature. Interestingly, a distant ancestor of Birthnoth uh, had died fighting Edwig's grandfather, Edward the Elder, at the Battle of Holm at the beginning of the 10th century, possibly indicating the long lasting dynastic tensions between the Mercians and the West Saxons, this being calmed by Edwig's promotion of Birthnoth to his inner circle, a foundation for good relations, which will last for another 50 or so years in the West Saxon kingdom. Factionalism and dynastic issues plagued Edwig, Edwig's young court, and yet from available evidence, Edwig seemed to have taken a forceful hand at dealing with the contentious courtiers through a lavish program of largesse. The focal point in Edwig's brief reign is seemingly the climactic schism between brothers Edwig and Edgar. Uh, famed historian F.M. Stenton describe Edgar's, describes Edgar's removal to Mercia, stating it was probably through mere irresponsibility that within two years of his ascension, Edwig lost the greater part of his kingdom. Gleefully and not without a dose of malice, the anonymous biographer of the Vita Dunstani, the life of the Archbishop Dunstan, describes the apparent revolt against Edwig's imprudent reign and the election of Edgar to rule in Mercia, stating he acted foolishly in the government committed to him, ruining with vain hatred the shred and wise, admitting with loving zeal the ignorant and those like himself. They chose this king for themselves with God's guidance, his brother, Edgar. Though seemingly a major rift between two young brothers, Denton goes on to note that there is no trace of any particular feeling behind this revolution. It was not followed by any important change in the distribution of the great provincial governments. A seismic rift between royal brothers that splits the kingdom into two sections and nothing changes? Rather than view this division of the kingdom as a clash between siblings, Frank Biggs argues that this partition of power fits into a grander schema of joint kingship that often typified Anglo-Saxon kingdoms from the earlier eighth and ninth centuries. A common occurrence throughout the earliest eras of the Heptarchy, joint kingship often served a multitude of purposes, including training the presumptive heir for their royal duties, as well as acknowledging the limited independence of a subservient kingdom, such as the recently acquired Mercian territories during the reign of Edwig. Historian Barbara York even comments and finds uh, evidence for joint kingship under a variety of circumstances, including close kinsmen sharing the throne, uh, even outside conquerors such as Offa, uh, allowing for local autonomy, thus ensuring a measure of good relations, as well as clearly delineating the sometimes overly complicated lines of succession. Joint kingship can be found throughout the early history of the Heptarchy, including legendary founders of the Kingdom of Kent, Hengst and Horsa, who both ruled as equal and co-kings. Now the question remains, if joint rule was such a prominent feature of Anglo-Saxon kingship, why was Edwig's division of power between himself and his younger brother, and seemingly chosen successor, such a contentious point among chroniclers of Edwig's reign? Well, Significantly, Biggs argues that joint rule appears to have disconcerted chroniclers because it seemed contrary to a Christian ideal of kingship, where succession under God's control should be simply a legitimate son following his father to the throne. The church long condemned the presence of joint kingship in early Anglo-Saxon history, as described in Bede's ecclesiastical history, which alludes to numerous joint rules while continually linking the disastrous practice with the abandonment of Christianity. For instance, in the ecclesiastical history, Bede discusses the kingdom of the East Saxons in the seventh century. 
dating Sabert, king of the East Saxons, who, when he sought the everlasting kingdom, left as his heirs to a temporal kingdom, his three sons, who had remained heathen. They began immediately to practice openly the idolatry, which during his lifetime, they seemed to have left off a little, and freely to give permission to their subjects to worship idols. Numerous other examples exist in the ecclesiastical history of Bede aligning joint kingship or shared rule with the abandonment of Christian teachings, inextricably linking the practice with a kingdom's absence of God's favor. The tradition of joint kingship and the church protestations against the practice, long established by Bede and other churchmen, revolved around the idea of sacral kingship and the importance of the church's participation in the coronation ceremony as central to legitimizing royal authority. Following in Merovingian and later Carolingian fashion, Anglo-Saxon kings needed the support and approval of a class ecclesiastic in their kingdom to signal their legitimate right to rule, as well as the legitimacy of their successors. Lacking church approval could spell disaster for a dynasty. As Bede gleefully alludes to in his instance of Sabert's heathen offspring. While Anglo-Saxon kings continue to follow the Germanic tradition of partible inheritance, churchmen strove to undermine the practice of joint rule through direct condemnation and propaganda. In Edwig's case, Dunstan, a vocal proponent of Benedictine monastic reform, used the young king's scandalous reputation to perform a damnatio memori, altering perception of Edwig's rule. Rather than continuing to rule a stable kingdom, Dunstan tars Edwig with sexual amorality, impudence, and abandonment of Christian kingship. In the Vita Dunstani, Dunstan's biographer graphically described Edwig's unfitness for rule in the infamous coronation debacle. Uh, Edwig, the son of King Edmund, succeeded, who being in young years started to rule with little prudence, although as the elected monarch, he ruled by right over both peoples. A certain foolish woman, noble by birth, with, her, with a daughter ripe and alluring, attached herself to him. She pursued him and enticed him into intimate relations, clearly in order to ally either herself or her daughter with him in marriage. It is said the king consorted with them alternately, shamelessly. The biographer goes on to relate how on the day of his coordination, Edwig slipped away from the celebratory banquet to rendezvous with these scandalous women, stating after the common election of all the English nobles on the very day of this solemn occasion, he suddenly rushed out full of lust, leaving the merry banquet for the arms of that, excuse the language, whore. Bishop Oda of Canterbury bemoaned the sad state of affairs, the young king leaving his nobles for an illicit rendezvous and beseech some of the fellow guests to go after the wayward king. Unwilling to face the wrath of the young king or the ladies in question, neither noble nor cleric were eager to undertake the task of wrangling a young teenager back to his celebratory banquet. Unsurprisingly, Abbot Dunstan, along with a clerical kinsman, volunteered to wrest Edwig away from his lascivious pursuits, whether he wished to or not, damn the consequences. Dunstan's biographer paints a rather graphic scene as Dunstan and his kinsmen enter the royal bedchamber, writing, they entered thus commanded and they found the royal crown, which shone forth in splendor of wonderful metalwork, gold, silver, and gems, far from the king's head and lying carelessly tossed to the ground. Not the least bit perturbed by the sight of the crown of the West Saxons carelessly tossed to the floor amidst what one would guess to be other garments, Dunstan's harangues the king to remember his duty and leave the adulterous repose he so currently enjoyed. After a heated exchange, Dunstan then snatched the king from the bed, slapped the crown on his head, leading him by the hand back to his noble company, snatching him by force from his women. A scandalous and altogether indecorous recorded beginning to the reign of Edwig, recounted in vibrant and lascivious detail by Dunstan's own biographer, demonstrates the power of a single-minded monastic reformer with an ax to grind. Dunstan and later his biographer revel in the sordid nature of Edwig's early reign, delighting in painting Edwig as a young hedonist, impudent and imprudent, 
ignoring the wise counsel of advisors such as the sanctified Dunstan. Though Edwig would marry his young paramour, Elfgaipa, the marriage would ultimately be annulled, though through the intervention of Bishop Oda on the laws of consanguinity. And within the dissolution of this marriage can be, the, see, be seen the collision of court factionalism and math, monastic reform. Before the dissolution of her marriage, Elfgaipa, along with her mother, Ethel Gifu, stood as witness to numerous charters, including attesting to the newly risen elderman, Birthnoth, as well as the attestations of several other close kinmen, kinsmen to positions of power within the church. Royal power to appoint and invest churchmen was a hotly contested issue within the church during the 10th century, and obviously centuries later. And Edwig's appointment of his in-laws to positions within the church must have ruffled more than a few clerical feathers. Archbishops Oda and Dunstan both waged a concerted campaign to bring the church in England more fully under the Benedictine reforms sweeping across Europe. The idea of sacral kingship working under the divine sanction of the church could not be tolerate, uh, could not tolerate an ecclesiastic structure overburdened with grasping relatives of the king's whorish wife. For Dunstan, who reveled in his position as abbot of Glastonbury, the proverbial writing was soon on the wall. Before the forced dissolution of her marriage, Elfgaifa took great joy uh, in her harrying Dunstan at court. Uh, possibly she took exception to her moniker of the new Jezebel and at his monastery. In an epic twist, Idwig and his council were persuaded to prescribe Dunstan and seize both his personal property and the abbacy at Glastonbury. Edwig named a new abbot, Elfsiege, as abbot of the monastery, with Dunstan being forced to flee to Flanders to await his eventual return. Such political machinations hardly reflect a weak king. Rather, Edwig's ability to oust the influential abbot and stack the church and elderminies with supporters indicates the strength of Edwig's position in 956 and 957. Though later portrayed as foolish and an enemy of monastic reform, surviving charter evidence paints an altogether different picture of the boy king. Surviving charter evidence indicates that royal monastic endowment for Edwig's reign matched those of his predecessor, his uncle Idrid, but his legacy would be touted as one in which royal authority flouted monastic endowment and reform. Edwig's poor reputation seemingly stems from his elevation of new men and reliance on them rather than the church to his political advantage. Though Edwig's reign saw no major disruptions or revolts, he is damned as a foolish king who gave too easily of himself to his baser nature. This monastic campaign of Damnatio Memori has little to do with Edwig's personal life and certainly more to do with his feuds with the leading churchman Dunstan, who ultimately would outlive the young king. Edwig's troubled reign must be viewed in tandem with the later reign of his brother Edgar, nicknamed the Peaceable, who would also have his turn with amorality and sexual scandals. Edgar's reign was no less scandalous, but for very specific reasons, he would be regarded as the ideal Anglo-Saxon monarch with his elder brother's memory left to languish on the rubbish heap of history. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Doty. Last but not least, our third presenter is Dr. Robin Herman. Rob received his PhD in 2004 from Washington University in St. Louis. He's an associate professor of British history at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, where he specializes in early modern England, the Atlantic world, and the British Empire, and where he holds the Richard G. Neheisel Endowed Professorship in History. His publications include Real Change and Imagined Catastrophe, the Culture of Money in Restoration England, which is currently under revision, as well as chapter contributions to history, fiction, and the Tudors, sex, politics, power, and artistic license in the Showtime television series, and the Empire of Credit, Financial Revolution in the British Atlantic World. 
Robin has also published numerous journal articles. His presentation is entitled Urges and Purges, The Life of Appetite in Restoration England, in which he will examine transformation of appetites in the, in the popular imagination from dangerous and corrosive passions to rational and necessary instruments that might therefore stimulate England's commerce. It's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Rob Herman. I was saying thank you, Craig, and then I remembered I was muted. So here I am. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, here we go. In 1674, a petition against coffee authored on behalf of several thousands of buxom good women was published in London. The petition, which argued that coffee turned men into impotent gossips, took issue with the emergent consensus that coffee made men sociable and was therefore useful, not only for commerce, but also for the commonwealth. The author, identified only as a well-willer, criticized Englishmen as Frenchified and eunuched by their running a whoring after such variety of destructive foreign liquors and spending their money on an ugly Turkish enchantress to such a degree that they cannot stand to it and in the very first charge fall down flat before their wives. The impotence of such men with their empty pantaloons that have allowed them to be cuckolded by dildos is however only one aspect of their emasculation Equally offensive to the author is their transformation into gossipy animals who produce a thousand monster opinions and absurdities about most important subjects, as what color the Red Sea is of, or whether the Great Turk be a Lutheran or a Calvinist. In short, men's unnatural appetite for coffee has unmanned them, and the only way to reverse such a disastrous transformation is the pro prohibition of, all, of coffee to all men under 30, to be replaced by the consumption of lusty beer and cock ale. A reply to the women's petition, the men's answer, appeared in the same year to defend both coffee and men from the claims made in the earlier pamphlet. The problem the second pamphlet claims with the relationship between the genders is not the fact that men cannot perform the sex act, but rather that men desire it too often, or rather that women desire it too often. The second author agrees that men have been cuckolded, but not by unnatural appetites for coffee, but by the unnatural and an insatiable lust of their wives. Men have been pimps to their own wives and cannot be esteemed a gentleman that has not seven times passed the torrid zone of a venereal distemper. In such, in such a sexual economy, coffee serves as a kind of 17th century Viagra and far from emasculating men, instead makes the erection more vigorous, the ejaculation more full adds a spiritual essence to the sperm and renders it more firm and suitable to the gusto of the womb. As for the charge that coffee transformed men into gossips, the men needed, needed to talk in their coffee houses since at home they have scarce time to utter a word where the din of their wives' voracious carnal and culinary appetites had drowned them out. As a result, the coffee house had become the last refuge for men, a citizen's academy and newsmongers exchange where they consume the one item that could make them both wise and sober. As outrageous as this debate over coffee undoubtedly was, these two pamphlets reveal the contours of a wide ranging debate that occupied many restoration authors, the question of the appetites. The rise in consumption in the second half of the 17th century is by now, by now a familiar story. What is less well understood are the ideological and discursive shifts that accompanied and helped to explain such a rise. Since the Renaissance, when appetites for any kind of material, earthly objects, sex, money, consumer goods, were still condemned as passions and therefore dangerous and corrosive to the commonwealth, a small but significant minority of philosophers had begun to consider means by which the passions might be tamed and directed for the good of society. As it is also possible to detect in the writings of Mandeville and Adam Smith in the 18th century, the conclusion of such a process I will argue in this paper that the life of the appetites in Restoration England illustrates a crucial phase in its evolution. Restoration culture marked the transfer, transformation of the appetites from dangerous passions to necessary instruments of the emerging consumer system. The central idea focused on the argument that sober, calm, and above all, rational appetites could not only check the wilder, more dangerous passions of man, but also spur England's commerce. 
avarice and lust were no longer subversive, but needed to be that needed to be controlled, but reasonable consumer demands, which similarly intelligent capitalists could help to supply. The debate over coffee, however bizarre, nonetheless illustrates the terms of the discourse other more, quote, respectable writers would also use when considering the appetites. As we will see, these two pamphlets were far from alone in their conflation and fear of appetites for things, such as coffee, and appetites for sex. Both pamphlets also assumed that as long as one practiced moderation and discretion in one's appetites, consuming the right thing in the right amounts, that sobriety, industriousness, and productivity would be the natural result. Both positions can be located in the celebrated verse of the period. John Dryden's Honest Mirabilis has often been read as a celebration of English imperialism and commerce, and there is much, particularly in the concluding stanzas of the poem, to support such an interpretation. Dryden envisioned a triumphal moment for England in which the nation's commerce, or sorry, commercial and imperial might, might would ensure peace and prosperity, creating one city of the universe where some may gain, well, but all may be supplied. Such optimism concerning appetites, the channeling of avarice for the social good, is belied by Dryden's history of trade a few stanzas earlier in the poem. Here, Saturn appears as the inventor of commerce, which considering his unnatural, extremely unnatural appetites is at very least a problematic beginning. Indeed, part of the project of the poem appears to be the separation of commerce from its literally cannibalistic origins and to associate it instead with generosity, sacrifice, and an earned abundance. Such a goal is part and parcel of Dryden's broader argument, considering the character of Charles II, whose reign by the time of the poem had attracted much criticism for Charles's own unnatural appetites and their disastrous consequences, allegedly. Dryden's polemic against such attacks was to domesticate Charles's sexual appetites, while at the same time taming and directing the nation's appetite for abundance and luxury through charity. He clearly believed that the indulgence of the baser appetites, whether sexual or commercial, was unhealthy, but he also imagined the possibility that the old values of the body politics, such as paternity, generosity, and charity, could infuse and rejuvenate the new world of partisan politics and increasing consumption. The optimism of Annus Mirabilis begins belongs to 1666, when victory seemed near in Charles's first Anglo-Dutch war. The savage satire of Andrew Marvel's The Last Instructions of the next year clearly belongs to the end of the war, as much of the poem is a catalog of reasons why the English lost the war to the Dutch so badly. In the wake of naval disaster and national humiliation, Marvel finds Dryden's optimistic portrayal of an England governed by sober appetites drastically wanting and insufficient. In Marvel's England, appetite for money and sex runs wild and leads the king, his court, and most of the governors of the realm into bizarre and unnatural sexual mm, escapades. Not only does the king fail to produce offspring legitimately, but his affairs set an example for the rest of the court, which enervates the whole of the English people. For Marvel, the Dutch invasion up the Medway sailed on a wind of moral rectitude. The debauchery of the king and those who followed his example allowed the appetites to replace love as the force which knit, knits the polity together, and England itself had begun to unravel. For Marvel, hunger for coin and animalistic appetites appeared inextricable in the world of the Restoration. The poet made this connection clear during his depiction of the Dutch victory over the English navy. Charles' sailors cannot resist the virile Dutch because English hunger for coin has already laid the ground for the defeat. Although the, gov the government has already marked, quote, how the Navy eats, it refused to pay their wages, which forced the sailors into treachery in order to acquire money. Quote, an English pilot too, O shame, O sin, cheated of pay, was he that showed the Dutch in, unquote. Once the battle was joined, Marvel lamented the state of our seamen, whom no danger shape could fright, unpaid, refused to mount our ships for spite. The king's ministers are certainly at fault for stealing the revenue and treasure of the realm. But this hunger for coin is not limited to the upper echelons of the government and instead seems to pervade the English people. Patriotism may uh, perhaps no longer had any purchase among the English Navy. Lust, hunger for coin, and all that it could buy, and Marvel's argument have driven it out. 
No longer can the government rely on patriotism to bind the state together and to motivate its subjects to defend it in its need. As the shameful example of the English pilot demonstrates, the state that can most effectively satiate the desire of its subjects now has the real power to command and motivate men. The poets of the Restoration then, aesthetic investigation of the appetites served political ends. Dryden located the virtue of the English monarchy and polity and their ability to check their appetites with the virtues of a pre-Civil War political model, while Marvell's scathing attack centered on England's inability to remember those same virtues and subsequent surrender to unrestrained appetites. Rochester's own, the Earl of Rochester's political work shares certain assumptions with those of Dryden and Marvell, the polemical verse of all three focus on the transformative potential of appetite for England and its people. Of the three, Rochester is, uh, I wrote perhaps, but I really mean definitely, <laughs> the most explicit about his use of sexuality to investigate radical and subversive politics. Rochester made much of the damage Charles inflicted on the English polity through the indulgence of his lusts to the shame of the nation. For the Rochester of the satire against mankind, the sexual politics of the current king almost wholly banished the old metaphor of the affective body politic and replaced it with a world governed instead by the laws of appetite and desire. Um, while Rochester makes the parallel between sex and governance clear enough for Charles, the famous line, his scepter and his prick are of an equal length, in the satire against mankind, he proposes a similar dynamic as salutary for the nation as a whole, since, quote, your reason hinders, mine helps to enjoy, renewing appetites yours would destroy. My reason is my friend, yours is a cheat. Hunger calls me out, my reason bids me eat. Perversely, yours, your appetite does mock. Rochester appears here to use reason and affect as tools for the governance of society in ways that were entirely different from those imagined in print at Whitehall and on the stage before the Civil Wars. For Jacobean commentators on reason used it to rule and check the appetites and passions. The only role allotted to reason by Rochester is that of a mechanism which will advance private and subjective desire. Reason allows sense to determine action and acts as a break on desires only to conserve them therefore no longer checks the appetites, but facilitates their indulgence. Rochester's reason is him to eat. Certainly any discussion of the appetites would be incomplete without considering how the English people of the Restoration actually ate, or at least how their food was marketed to them in cookbooks. Certainly the cookery manual was not novel in the Restoration, but the real explosion in cookbook publishing seems to have happened during and because of the Civil Wars, just like publishing exploded in the Civil Wars for all genres. Food was scarce in these troubled decades and the cookbooks of the 1650s in particular offered not just recipes, but instructions on preserving food. Instructions which would appear increasingly useful to the population living through the wars. The restoration, however, the political and economic dimensions of the appetites that cookbook authors believed themselves to be catering to became substantially more complicated. Before the Civil Wars, cookbook authors wrote for the nobility and country gentry and offered an idealized vision of self-sufficient landholders who would grow most of their own food and would thus have no need for foreign uh, culinary pretensions. Histrionics aside, this is a vision of English political economy that is not all that far from the one advanced by the author of the petition against coffee discussed above, with its disdain for all things foreign and advocation of consumption of native English food and drink. Similarly, the men's answer, if we look past the extraordinary uh, claims for coffee as a sex aid, reflects the increasingly global dimensions of the restoration economy, as well as the sanguine view most commentators took of said economy. The consumer and economy and its appetites, I would argue, found expression in the cookbooks of the Restoration. As English markets steadily filled with foreign goods, English cookbooks gradually shed their parochial dimensions. Several of the most notable French books were translated into English, and many native writers began to incorporate French recipes and tastes. 
administration cookbooks also began to acknowledge an idea that had recently become current in the more straightforwardly economic literature of the 1650s and 1660s. That self-interest ap appetite, sorry, could spur the economy and act therefore for the social good. 1661, William Ravisha displayed a prematurely clear grasp of the multiplier principle, which later economists would make so much of. He justified continuing to direct his cookbook to the nobility by arguing that the food which, quote, they pay for, by which all men live, for all that they have comes to the purse, pocket, back, and belly of all men yearly. The nobility are like a great wheel that moves the next, and so they move on the other, one the other, that none stands idle, the removing of which is the destruction of the whole, unquote. As the nobility indulge their appetites then and prepare the recipes Ravishan and his competitors provided, such economic activity created business and employment opportunities throughout the country. This kind of interdependent and international economy envisioned in the restoration cookery manuals was far removed from the self-sufficient and independent landowners envisioned in their Jacobean predecessors. But what gets interesting is when you think about the appetites of the nobility, being far from the only concern of the restoration cooker, cooks or cook, cookery authors, a fact which illustrates their surprisingly subversive political potential. On the one hand, all of the major cookbooks of the second half of the 17th century are infused with a heavy dose of pre-Civil War nostalgia, which is hardly surprising. And all of the major authors take time in their prefaces and sometimes even in their recipes, to voice the principles and virtues of the Renaissance body politic deference, hierarchy, and charity. On the other hand, however, the very nature of such texts seem to allow at the same time new kinds of political, economic, political and economic maneuvers that the old model of politics could not incorporate. Robert May's cookbook, reprinted six times over the course of the restoration, concluded a discussion of an Elizabethan entertainment with the admission that this entertainment was, quote, formerly the delights of the nobility. While both Rabasha and May explicitly state that they are making culinary knowledge and techniques which had previously been restricted to the aristocracy and gentry available now to the wider public. Here we see acknowledgments of the appetites of the class that would later be called the bourgeoisie, but at this stage still refers to itself as the middling sort. As their consumption and commerce became increasingly important in the marketplace, some clearly wanted little to do with aristocratic appetites and tastes but enough had dreams of higher status and social mobility to support, for example, Hannah Wally's or Woley's extensive publishing career. Other authors may have made gestures towards the buying power of the new middle class, but none were more popular than Woley. His cookbooks utilized aristocratic recipes as a vehicle to give the women of the middling sort means to navigate and profit from an increasingly complex consumer economy. Like Rabisha and May, she made aristocratic recipes available to the public, which was provocative enough. She went further, however, by providing her readers with the means to make their homes, their means, and their tables appear richer and more fashionable than they really were. Woley understood the appetites then as many of her contemporaneous economic commentators also did as an abstract principle. She recognized that the, that the desire to better oneself, or at least to appear better, through the show of superior taste, always powers the economy, fuels consumption. From cookbooks to coffee and verse satires and celebrations, the appetites occupied a broad swath of restoration authors. The debate appears to have focused on the question of whether the appetites should be checked by the power of the state, acting in accordance with the ideology of the body politic, or if calm and sober reason could instead channel the appetites for the health and good of society. Analysis of the discourse, however, can only take us so far, of course. In conclusion, I will demonstrate how the life of the appetites played out for one restoration aristocrat, Sir Robert Shirley. His accounts and correspondence reveal a minor noble reveling in all the indulgence his ability to command credit afforded him. His ability to consume heavy foods and liquors appears to have been truly prodigious. His bills from London are replete with orders for racks of mutton and casks of ale disposed with, from our perspective, alarming speed. It all seemed to fall apart, however, when he fell ill as a result of this consumption and was prescribed a course of 
Literally, it says this, purgative pills. Shirley was hardly the only aristocrat who felt the need for such medicine. The approximately 31 pounds the Earl of Shaftesbury spent on apothecary's wares for his household from August to October in 1672, for example, one sixth of it was used to purchase purgative pills, potions, and infusions. This is all the information we have. The bills for these two men illustrate not only the apparent popularity of purgative courses, which is more what I'd like to know more about, but also how prominent aristocrats such as Shaftesbury could use social capital to guarantee credit, while men like Shirley could not. The Earl paid the apothecary's bill uh, nearly two years after the last charge. By contrast, Shirley's rivers of credit and ale dried up at almost exactly the same time. The young nobleman who could put away several casks while convincing others to foot the bills in 1668 appears vastly different from the chastened man who began his journey to health, teetotaling, and fiscal prudence and responsibility in January of 1672. His appetite and means for indulgence vanished, Shirley retreated to his Leicestershire estate, adopted a seafood diet, and began planting orange trees. The economic and advice literature of the day had begun to call for sobriety and temperance in one's appetites and behaviors for the maintenance of personal and national health. With his purges and his oranges, it was a message that Shirley took to heart. Shaftesbury, on the other hand, began to eat oranges as well at around the same time as Shirley, but continued to drink at a pace uh, that Shirley could neither match nor afford. Anyways, then Shirley's moves towards something like a bourgeois sensibility exemplify the life of the appetites in Restoration England. He did his best in the 1660s to illustrate the danger of the appetites. Living far beyond his means, indulging his lust for unhealthy food, and in general playing the role of the irresponsible noble to the hilt, he was exactly the kind of Englishman Marvel savaged in the last instructions. After his own personal crisis, in, a year, in years of national crisis, he began to adopt a more temperate, logical, certainly more sober, literally, approach to his own economy. It, impos it is impossible to know, of course, if Shirley had read or was even aware of Woolley, but the changes in his diet nonetheless followed her advice. She scorned the way aristocrats ate beef, quote, as a miscellaneous hodgepodge of studied vanity and advocated for, quote, sober, moderate, and modest living, unquote. It seems likely that she would, approved of, she would have, have approved of the way Shirley's orange groves and seafood consumption made him part of local and global commerce. He sought to build a smaller version of the rational and predictable economy that was fast becoming a trope of the economic literature. Such writing sought to legitimize the appetites and everything they powered consumption to capitalism through an argument that centered on the beneficent power of self-interested, reasonable appetites. Shirley's right, life illustrates how that debate was lived in practice. The satire against mankind, Rochester argued that kings had no power to direct the wants and reasons of men, reason of men, and that the free play of appetites would heal the body politic. At the same time, Rochester's poem, Shirley had begun to plant his oranges in an effort to heal himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harmon. Okay, now we will open up the floor, so to speak, for a few questions uh, for our panelists. And let's... Uh, Should we leave our cameras on or what, what does James want us to do? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Okay, we have a question for Dr. Cavell from Timothy Strain. It says, Dr. Cavell, I am unfamiliar with the British Whig opposition at the end of the War of 1812. Was it a significant portion, the population or the voting classes? Now, that's a great question, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, yes, indeed, it was a very important uh, portion of the the uh, the nobility. In fact, there are a lot of noblemen who are members of the Whig opposition party. They're incredibly powerful. Uh, Charles James Fox being and, and the Foxites are certainly a big part of it still at this point. Um, 
we also have the, the people I spoke about who actually went to visit with Napoleon on his island, Lords Ellenborough, um, as well as um, Lords Holland, Lord Holland and his wife go over there. I mean, these are members of the, the British elite and um, certainly they are very strong in opposition. Not strong enough to topple the Tories though. I mean, the Tory government is going to stay in place until 1827 uh, and under Lord Liverpool. So that administration is going to have really long legs that go throughout. So really with the, the end of the war and particularly the end of the Napoleonic War, that opposition seems to just fade into the background. Uh, at least until all the, the unrest starts to happen in the post-war period, which is, you know, generally not talked about very much, but it is really unsettled times. You know, lots of soldiers and sailors coming back and flooding the employment market and creating all sorts of social upheavals. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a turbulent time, but when is it not in British politics? It's, uh, it, it seems to just be uh, on, on a rotating cycle. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Sam, I actually had a question. I was kind of curious as going back to the Congress of Vienna, talking a little bit about uh, how the other great powers were uh, sort of condemning the, the British for their, their weak performance. I'm wondering what their reaction was to their the British conclusion of the Treaty of Ghent without actually winning outright or in fact their defeat at New Orleans if there was any reaction from the great powers to that uh there is some um but as far as uh, Lord Castlereagh who was managing all the discussions at the, the Congress of Vienna I mean he is a, a, a slick operator he knows how to handle these these challenges in very uh subtle and effective ways um, and I think he, what he's really looking to do is manage this intensifying relationship between the Prussians and the Russians. And it's always been the Russians who've been pushing hardest against Britain's maritime belligerent rights and mar maritime rights claims, essentially, you know, her, her naval and her commercial shipping claims. Um, and in fact, they tried to insert themselves into the peace negotiations. Russia presented herself as a moderator to the, the Americans and the British to kind of come up with a peace settlement here. And the British are like, thanks, but we've got this, you know, uh, we don't need your help. Uh, so this, this management of these allies, particularly Prussia and Russia coming together in some sort of an axis is really concerning, which is why Castlereagh invests heavily in bringing the French into the discussions and bringing Talleyrand in. So quite honestly, you know, Castlereagh gets a lot of flack, a lot of feedback from his own government and from the British people for what he's negotiating here. And uh, the, the criticism generally comes in the form that you're supporting Ancien Regime despots. You know, Britain is now supporting the old line crowd that we really don't want to have around here anymore. But it's not quite that simple. You know, he, he really, I think he does quite an extraordinary job of maintaining Britain's dominance really within this balance of a power uh, equation that is that is being debated at, at Vienna. It's an incredibly important meeting and there's so much action that happens there. Um, but I think Castlereagh for Britain handles it very, very well. Yeah, absolutely. Congress of Vienna was, was critical. Yeah. I'm interested in the uh, his, his reaching out to Talleyrand. I'm, I'm guessing long before that uh, Polish-Saxon controversy that, that really brings Talleyrand back into the big picture. And I'm also interested in the, uh, the, the, the Russian position since by this point they think of themselves as entitled since they consider themselves the liberators of Europe from Napoleon. Yeah, and, and after all, the Russians have a 500, 600,000 man army. I mean, they're, as far as Alexander is concerned, he, he doesn't have to negotiate here. He's the guy on the ground with the army to be able to do something uh, in the event of, of immediate action required. And, um, and it really takes some wrangling. Uh, you know, Castlereagh is very careful to bring the Austrians on side as well, you know, and sort of get this right. Austrian French coalition uh, to stand up against what he sees as a, as a growing problem between the Prussians and the Russians. Quite right. Thank you. Uh, 
we have time for 30 or 40 more questions. <laughs> Anybody out there? As long as they're one second long. <laughs> well, uh, Lauren, I have a quick uh, quick question. And first of all, my, my compliments on your pronunciations of 10th century names. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wondering if the uh, targeted audience of the, the, the propaganda against uh, the damned King Edwig, if the target audience was the church itself or maybe the, uh, the nobility? Oh, it's definitely nobility and later kings. It's, it's giving this model of what kingship is supposed to look like. It's sacral, it's approved by the church. We don't share kingship, it's from father to son this parallel and partable inheritance that is very much a Germanic practice is condemned over and over and over in church literature. They, they can't stand it because they have much more control over father to son, father to son. And having that you know coronation ceremony, very important to the legitimacy of not only the line, but of kingship itself. So the church has been hammering away at this practice and to have Edwig being so young, come in with these new courtiers, these new men who are, who are supporting him and, and have him split the kingdom when it's just now coming together as sort of early Saxon England, it's just too much for Dunstan. And then for him to be uh -huh. so obvious with his, uh, his wife, his flagrancy and her to very much take an active position against Dunstan and have so much so that he drives him out. It, it's too much for a churchman to bear. So he's writing these things, he's detailing these things. So future kings will not repeat this. Thank you very much. Looks like I have a message here from James thanking us for the session. Uh, James, are we ready to wrap it up? Unless you guys have other questions for each other, I mean, we're happy to keep going if you guys want to continue the conversation. Well, we did have one thing uh, for, for Rob here. Uh, yeah. you, the very end, you were talking about the purgative pills. I'm wondering if maybe those were for strictly for physical purposes or the were spiritual purposes, since we're talking about uh, the differences between uh, harmful and salutary appetites. Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, gathering you know and everything i've been able to learn about apothecaries in 17th century england um i don't think they had any spiritual you know remit right they don't i don't think they, they trafficked in that kind of thing um i can't say for sure you know i mean i i was just i remember being just, dazzled and befuddled by the reference it, by just looking at Shirley's archive you know like you watch him go from mutton 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 purge oranges you know <laughs> I've been trying to find out ever since you know what's in a purgative pill um because like I said with Shaftesbury you know it's not the last time I've come across these things since then and um not having a lot of luck <laughs> figuring that out um, future avenue so i mean i'm guessing it's you know that I, ha I have come across like, stray references to them and other people's monographs on uh on you know just kind of doctors and physics and, and and medicine and whatnot um i don't think they're anything more than just fish oil <laughs> i mean it the, the 17th century equivalent of fish oil. You know, I don't think. <laughs> sure. I don't think they have a lot of real benefit, but um, I can't say. Like I said, I can't say for sure. Okay. So, <laughs> I wish I could. I have, I have a question for Rob. Um, so some the language in in the these exchanges that are going back and forth is is pretty raunchy and pretty uh, intense. Um, I'm just kind of questioning, like. You know, I know that Rochester's plays are just insane, even by today's standards. Were people shocked at reading this, or is this just part of the the, the restoration freeness that has come back, and people are embracing whatever? Um, I mean, there's definitely uh, 
part of it's the restoration freeness. I, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, well, you can't call them Puritans anymore, but I mean, there's definitely the dissenter populace, right? That's on their way to becoming Methodist. Um, that, you know, they're, they're wagging their fingers and they're looking down their noses at these people. But one of the things that, I mean, in the years that I've been teaching, you know, the early modern period and, and is that there's always this, not always, but this, there's this element of what we think of as launch. <laughs> like that's almost always there in the 16th and 17th centuries, right? And it's, you know, I mean, my wife is a medievalist, uh, so she's always at pains to tell me, you know, it's there in the Middle Ages too, which is true. <laughs> so and then, you know, like the 18th century, as I'm sure you know, Sam, I mean, satires against Pitt, for example. That's the cartoons like, are incredible. The cartoons, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. um, I show those to my, you know, 300 level undergraduates and even they, they, they are with us. <laughs> So um, I really do think that this image we have of like, I'm sure I'm not saying anything y'all don't already know, right? I, I really do think this image we have of the English is like this repressed, stiff upper lip. I just think that's all Victorian. Yeah. Because if you look at, if you look at English popular culture in the 16th and 17th centuries, they are rude. <laughs> I mean, I know the most about that because that's what I work on, right? But, I mean, I'm sure you could all attribute similar examples of what you've seen. Um, but so, I mean, I, you know, there is a, but I, I mean, is it like peaking in the restoration? You know, maybe so. There's a, there's definitely a, a, a sense in the 1660s, sure. Well, 1660s, 1670s, they're really like, you know, Puritans aren't around anymore to tell us what to do. Our king is a, you know, serial philanth publicly serial philanthrop philanderer. Um, let's go. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, you do get a sense that they're really, I guess you could say, like enjoying being naughty mm -hmm. um, in a way that maybe they hadn't before. That answers your question. Yeah, that's great. It does. Thank you, everybody. This was a, a wonderful session. Uh, there's a lot of merit to this uh, online virtual format. Of course, if we were all together, it would be time for happy hour. So there's drawback there. But it's been a wonderful time. So thank you all. And I guess we will yep. we'll shut this down. Thank you to everyone, to all the presenters, and also to everyone that tuned in in the audience. And everyone, y'all have Thank a great you. evening. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Take care.